Good morning, and welcome to the service of worship from the Pendleton Presbyterian Church. We're glad to have all of you with us, both uh, a sanctuary that is getting fuller and fuller, as children would say, every Sunday, and also people worshiping in our parking lot and on Facebook. We welcome you all. Direct your attention to the announcements that are in your bulletin this morning uh, on the back of your page. Uh, the handbells that we talked about recently, they have been purchased. And if you still would like to contribute to the handbell fund, then uh, you are able to do that. And we look forward to um, hearing them sometime during the upcoming Christmas and Thanksgiving season. Please note the announcements for the gingerbread houses um, on December the 5th, 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. If you would like to attend that, then please get in touch with Jamie Elders. Any other announcements that we should be made aware of? If not, let us begin to worship. And if you would, please refer to your bulletin for the prayer of confession. And if you're able, please rise. And let us pray together. Forgive us, O God, for our self-important boasting. We take credit for our efforts without thought of your gifts. When honors are bestowed, we treat them as our due. You shower us with blessings we ignore. You bring new life. We take it for granted. Deliver us from our vain ways and forgive our sins. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Paul declares, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Let us claim the new life in Christ with assurance. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you may be seated. You have the hymn on the insert if you would like to uh, follow along with it. We thank you for your offerings and tithes that have been placed in the log boxes in each of the vestibule. You may remain seated and let us use the prayer of dedication in your bulletin to dedicate our gifts to God and as we pray. O oh God, we offer ourselves as temples of your chosen one, Jesus Christ. Alive in the spirit and empowered by service, we go forth in his name to proclaim your love as a sanctuary for those in need. Amen. A reading this morning from the Old Testament is taken from the book of Psalms, and I shall read to you from the 77th Psalm, verses 11 through 20. As you hear the word of God, as the psalmist records God's mighty deeds and recalls them in faith, hear the word of God. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. <clears throat> I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your mighty deeds. 
Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. The very deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder in the whirlwind. You're lighting up the world. The earth trembled and it shook. Your way was through the sea. Your path through the mighty waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hands of Moses and Aaron. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. Now let us come before God in prayer, beginning in a moment of silent prayer while you offer the prayers that you have with you in your heart. Let us pray together. Now let us join together in a moment of common prayer. God, our Savior, to lift our prayers to you is good and acceptable. Hear us now as we come before you. Our Lord Christ dwells by your side and intercedes for us when our words fail. Angel songs blend with our voices, filling the air with hymns of praise. You are clothed with all honor and majesty. You alone are God, and we indeed worship you. Hear us now as we pray for those to whom we have entrusted the authority of government in these troubled days. We pray for their health, that they may be able to withstand the pressures of office. We pray for those who advise them that they may be given the wisdom required for each circumstance. We pray for the families, loved ones, and friends of our leaders, that they may be supportive in the midst of the burdens of public life in these days. Hear us as we pray for ourselves as citizens. Help us to be responsible and to blend the diversity of opinions with unified concern for the well-being of all of your children. Deliver us from suspicion of one another and help us to focus rather on the good of all. Save us from being high and mighty and lead us in the paths of righteousness and of service. You have taught us that through our Lord Jesus Christ that we can serve only one and we commit our allegiance to you alone. May all that we do be done to your glory so that one day we may hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray in the name of the one who came and taught us to pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now this morning, we're pleased that we will have a duet by Randy and Leslie Price.
Our reading this morning from the New Testament is taken from the book of Romans, and I shall read to you from the 8th chapter, verses 28 through 39, as you hear again the word of God. We know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What are we then to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not also give him everything else to bring to us? Who will bring charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for all of us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And we pray in the spirit of our living Christ that our understanding may now be added. Amen. We have been through a great deal, our world, in the last eight months or so. And to find words that will reveal the word of God is done by all of our ministers and those who preach the word with prayer and with hope that the words are helpful. But that's only one side of the picture. Long before this pandemic tragedy, I had come to the belief that it was in the nature of God to speak to you and to me and to human beings in the language and in the events of our lives, and that it is the task of the church to share what it believes. There is no evading that our world has been taken into a very dark place. Now, we must continue to look for flashes of light. I asked the same questions that most everyone did. Why has this thing happened? Why is there so much evil and causes pain and suffering in a world that we believe is created by an all good and all powerful God? And these are not new questions. They are age old. Before this atrocious act, I was already familiar with most of the attempted solutions to this problem of evil in a world created by a good and all powerful God. But up till now, nowhere had I found any single answer that settles all of the questions. And so the enigma remains what it always has been from the beginning, a dark and unsettling mystery. However, this, I admit to you, we cannot stop at this point of only saying it is a dark and unsettling mystery. While I cannot claim final understanding, I can share with you several things that are value to me when considering all of these losses. 
our first challenge is to go on living even though we have no complete explanations. First, we are to use our minds to try and understand and interpret the things that we have experienced. In this way, life begins to move on and whatever insight is possible becomes possible. In the first few weeks after the tragedy had become known, as I said earlier, we all asked why. But alongside that question, there were things that needed to be done. There were people who needed to be treated. And if we had turned away from these immediate needs until we found some sort of answer for the atrocity, that would have been to neglect our duties and responsibilities. A great preacher, Harry Emerson Fosdick, once remarked, a man can put off making up his mind, but he cannot put off making up his life. And I believe, as I have for years, that that statement has all of the realism of the Bible behind it. It speaks to the way that we human beings learn making up our minds. It is not something that we do before we experience anything of life. It comes to us as we experience it, through the experience, after the experience. In other words, we must first deal with what is in front of us before we can begin to move on. And that insight has helped me over the last few months to begin to move in a direction that, if not totally acceptable, is at least helpful. It challenges me, this biblical approach. It gives me no final answers, but it challenges me to face up to the situation and move on with faith in our Creator God. And the second thing the Bible gives me is a warning to beware of jumping to conclusions. The Bible shows us how to slow down by saying, in effect, wait a minute, be patient, let events begin to run their source because God is not finished with anything yet. And who knows what God may come and make of this event. And as you know, the Bible is full of stories like this. For example, Joseph and his traumatic life is one. As you recall, as a boy, he was his father's favorite. And the only thing his brothers could see in him was arrogance. They hated him. They sold him in slavery into Egypt. Yet look at what resulted. The hardship of this event developed a character that maybe never would have been developed had he remained pampered and spoiled. And later, he would save his family from starvation. As finite beings, this story is telling us we do not know the full import of events. The Bible reminds us that despair without hope for Christians is presumptuous. How do we know what lies in God's great plan for each of our lives? Or how some evil or what we determine to be evil may be worked out by God to end up a blessing? Our Bible bids upon us to wait upon the Lord, be patient before we label any experience of our lives or close any door of hope as something that is irreparable. Who are we to speak of what lies in the future, the great beyond? For always in our Bible, God breaks through human despair, and this faithfulness of God gives me hope. 
for our God is indeed a God of hope. The gods of other religions, they are content to lie fallow on the far side of the sky, but not our God of the Bible. Again and again, he comes into the circle of human life. And then in the fullness of time, he sent his son to reveal a great and enduring relationship with us and love for us. Our Lord Jesus, he made no attempt to hide the horror and pain that human life can bring. When the word was made flesh, we are told that he became a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. In Jesus, God has drawn human life close and understands from the inside our agony and pain. And most of us here today, we have suffered some pain and sense of loss in our lives. So we experience a certain kinship with those who have lost so much in this world epidemic and indeed in the last 19 years of strife and trouble that has come upon our world. And the God who came in Christ has established a bond of closeness with all humans. There's no illustration used by many about a World War II experience of a father who had lost his only son in that war. A minister was called to the home to speak to the parents. And the father, half in grief, and I think perhaps half in rage, said, I want to know where God was when my boy was killed. And the minister thought for a while, and I'm sure replied beyond his knowledge when he said, I guess God was the same place he was when his boy was being killed. And that reply, it is reported, had a revolutionary effect upon the father because it brought out God from remoteness and into this man's life as a grieving companion. The bond of closeness has resurfaced in my life and it has begun to offer comfort in these months when we all have watched so many suffer and felt wave after wave of helplessness. God seems to be saying, I know you all are suffering. I understand, <clears throat> for I watched my child suffer too. And now comes the third help from our Bible. It is what our God did about pain and evil. He not only watched his child suffer and die, he brought him even through death. And the raising of Jesus from the dead is not only the most important, greatest event in our Bible, but it is our basis for hope in the midst of human tragedy and in the personal tragedies of our lives. Here is what God can do with the personal tragedies that we confront when the powers of evil and destruction invade our world. He can turn it inside out and through transforming the evil begin to encourage newness and goodness. I believe the killing of Jesus had many motives behind it, but the main reason was an attempt to kill God. All the darkness of the world seemed to converge on that one point, to do that very thing, to do him in, and it failed. Jesus was resurrected. Evil cannot overcome God. God overcomes evil and transforms it 
into something good. That is our hope. What God did for Jesus, we dare to believe that he can do for everyone who has been unjustly injured. Many have died, but God will bring them through because we are told that nothing is ever lost in God, our creator. Not even a sparrow falls to the earth without his knowledge. And out of tragedy, God will not be overcome and I believe will somehow turn this evil. And his purpose is to bring light out of darkness. It is the way God always moves. Always, from the very beginning, from chaos into ever increasingly form of order. Your challenge and mine is to move forward in life courageously and not allow ourselves to get paralyzed. We are called to live in order to know. Our best hope is our vision of God that comes in his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and who is powerful enough to withstand all of the worst that evil can possibly do and bring something out of it that makes sense and that is rewarding to God's creation. And we must offer this experience like all of the tragedies in our lives, up to God and be patient. Life never comes to an end. There is always a resource. Frederick Beekner, a Presbyterian minister, reports in his writing that when the Germans were finished bombing the London skyline into a devastation and the bombing stopped and spring came, Londoners began to see crocus bloom in places where they had not been seen for many years. It seems that the space released by the bombs and fertilized by the nitrates in the bombs allowed these flowers to bloom in places where they had not been seen in over 400 years. The potential was there. It just had to be released. So let our faith inform us. Do all we can. Stay open and hopeful. Finally surrender our fears to God, who in all things works for good. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if you would please let us rise and affirm what we believe by repeating together the Apostles' Creed and let the children of God say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascendeth into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And our hymn in conclusion is 213, if you would like to follow along with that. Crown him with many crowns.
from our time that we have shared together apart from the world. Leave in the peace of Christ. Allow it to inform your life and living and share it with all. In the name of the Father and of the Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.